Welcome back to another edition of Somerville Media Center News Roundup with the Somerville Journal. I am happy to be joined once again with Julia Taliesin. How are you doing, Julia? I'm okay today, Dave. Thanks for asking. How about you? I'm hanging in there like everybody else. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so you're working hard at the Somerville Journal. There's a there's obviously a lot of news, a lot of stuff to cover. It seems to change by the day. Um, so let let's start off with um, some coronavirus updates uh, and the latest stats. We are recording this on Friday, April 24th. So by the time you see this, these uh, these numbers may be a little different. But uh, why don't you let us know where we are, Julia? Absolutely. So. Yes. Uh, as you said, these numbers change every day. The city has been amazing about updating their, their website with this data, so kudos to them. Um, as of today, um, over 450 people have tested positive, so 485 have tested positive. Um, of those, some have recovered, so 174 have recovered. Um, and so far, some of sadly, has had six fatalities due to the coronavirus. Um, but one thing there's a disclaimer on the website. You'll see it everywhere that is reporting data like this. We don't know. We don't know if that is completely accurate because of the lack of um, access to widespread testing. Even our local hospital, um, Cambridge Health Alliance, some rural hospital, they have a testing center but are having trouble accessing enough tests to actually know who among us are is truly infected um, by this virus. Um, so... Those are the numbers for today, <laughs> um, but this could absolutely change. Hmm. And you mentioned the Cambridge Health Alliance uh, testing site, mm -hmm. and uh, that's on uh, uh, that's adjacent to the Somerville Hospital. Is the uh, is that still just limited to uh, Cambridge Health Alliance uh, uh, insurance holders? Yes. So at this time. Um, I, I do believe the last I heard um, was that it is it is still limited to Cambridge Health Alliance patients. They do serve a pretty large population, um, and they they have hospitals in Everett as well. And those patients are also welcome. So it's not just CHA Somerville; it's CHA in general who are eligible for testing at that site. Um, so they have they they do have a relatively large population of people they could test. Um, but I think last I heard um, from the communications director, they're just, they just don't ha have access to enough testing kits to open it up. And I'm sure once they do, it's going to be big news um, because it's going to mean a lot more people have access to testing in this area. Let's, uh, let's talk about food security because that's, uh, that's been a big issue uh, before this crisis. And then in light of this crisis, um, you know, people are, uh, their, their incomes have been hampered possibly. Um, uh, and you know, where that next meal is coming from is, is a, a very, very important, uh, thing that families are considering. Um, are there some updates, uh, regarding food security? Sure. Um, so there are, there are several different lenses you can look at this through. Um, I think, you know, I've covered this from several angles. There's, you know, school children who depended on, um, you know, going to school for a meal every day. Um, many, I think it's 70% of, it is 70, 70% of um, Somerville students are eligible for free or reduced um, lunch, cost lunch. Um, so all of those students um, don't have access to that in the same way they did before. So um, I think on Wednesday, um, Tuesday or Wednesday, Somerville announced that they had, uh, they had shared over 21,000 meals uh, with families across Somerville, which is absolutely mind boggling, <laughs> so many. Wow. Um, but there have been volunteers pretty much since the beginning, um, volunteers, you know, PTA, um, family members, city staff, et cetera, at four schools um, spread across Somerville, delivering meals um, every weekday, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And, um, you know, people have been using that resource. Awesome. So people have been getting those meals. Um, so there's, you know, students, there's out of work bartenders. Um, for example, you know, I've talked to a lot of business owners um, who, you know, report that their staff are having to turn to resources they've never had to turn to before. Um, I have spoken with the Somerville Homeless Coalition, which, you know, in addition to trying to look out for the homeless population of this region, not just the city, um, they also run a food pantry, um, which serves, you know, anyone who, who needs it. 
um, in, in this specific area. And, um, though, you know, they don't really turn people away as much as they can. Um, but they said that the demand for their services out of that one food pantry has tripled and that they have had, I think 50% of the people they've had in the last month were new customers, which is significant. So, you know, while our vulnerable populations, the students still need more support than ever, there are also people who have never needed this support who are now turning to it because they're out of work and are having trouble affording food. Um, so there, there are a number of ways to look at this, <laughs> for sure. Um, so what do you want to talk about schools? What do you think? Yeah. Um, is, well, how, how are the, uh, the food pantries? Is it Project Soup that you were referring to? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yes, it's Project Soup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how are the, uh, the food donations uh, coming in? Like, are, are, is, is that number, has that increased since this crisis began? Um, anything about that? So I think at this time, um, you know, I, I haven't spoken with every pantry um, in the city at all. So this is kind of based on my conversation with the people at SHC. Um, at the moment, they're really trying to fundraise money because it lets them buy the services they need when they run out of what they or buy the um, supplies they need when they run out. Um, but they are still, you know, if you are willing to donate food, they will take it. Um, they said that they've received some donations of peanut butter, of cereal, um, and you know they have they have a system and a, you know a, a cleaning system set up to properly sanitize everything. They said you know everything is really spaced out. Um, they have tons of volunteers who've been trained in uh, safe food handling. Um, so they they are equipped. You know they've learned they've um, trained on how to manage this kind of thing. But they are still accepting donations. They want monetary donations, but they absolutely are accepting food donations. Um, when it comes to food, I think um, a lot of some restaurants have donated just like the food out of their walk in refrigerators when a lot of them had to close down. Uh, for example, I think the Burren in Somerville's Davis Square, they did that. Um, they've done that before. But a lot of um, restaurants in Somerville, some in Arlington as well, are donating prepared meals. Um, or prepackaged meals, whether it's what they tend to make anyways, um, like pasta or sandwiches or, um, God, who else? All, all sorts of things. Um, or just like packing up a bag with like some fruit and a granola bar that's donated from like the place down the street. And so everyone's kind of pulling together to get these resources out. But there's that kind of, there's there's two parts of it. There's like the food pantry in itself and then there are the, the businesses coming together to donate like meals. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if somebody is interested in making a donation to project soup or another food pantry, they should probably check uh, the website of those places Absolutely. to see like what the protocol is for donations. Because yes. and they, they have tons up. up there in some real homeless mm -hmm. Totally. Um, yeah. So this is a good segue into uh, food was food security is related to school as you mentioned, yeah. and um, the school year uh, was closed, uh, was uh, uh, canceled uh, for the mm -hmm. rest of the year. Um, so what can you tell us about that? Oh, God. Um, what can I tell you about that? I mean, over the past month, I've been trying to regularly check in with parents, um, with teachers, paraprofessionals, um, on how things are going. And... Um, I think everyone, everyone is a, a little devastated, <laughs> honestly. Um, so, I, you know, people are, people are figuring it out. Um, I, you know, I was talking to a Somerville mom in Ten Hills, in the Ten Hills neighborhood, and she was saying, uh, this was last weekend, um, and this week was April break. So she was like, we are not stepping under any circumstances. We've established a rhythm. <laughs> we are going to Far, like go on ahead and like we're, we're in this together like we got to keep going and figure it out but I remember speaking to her a month ago and she was like you know in, in her answers to me when I was asking her about how things were going and what she was hoping for she was just like please god everyone social distance so we can get back to school as fast as possible um because students miss their friends mm -hmm. like you know there's you know there's the food security aspect there's the you know parents being able to work aspect there's so many angles to this but kids just miss the environment and the community that school is. And, um, you know, at this time, 
Um, it's still pretty fresh. So that decision just came in, I think, on Monday or Tuesday uh, from the state to close schools through the remainder of this academic year. Um, and at that, in the, this week, Somerville hasn't released any kind of, you know, new um, learning information. It, it also is school break. Um, so a lot of people are not working this week, um, taking a, a well-deserved break, hopefully, of those, of those teachers. Um, but they have, I mean, they have a ton of remote learning resources on their website. And I do think it's possible that in the coming week or two that we're going to be seeing more things popping up um, mm -hmm. about kind of what kind of services they're offering and stuff. I will say, though, that um, when they release the information about providing meals to families, they also share that they've been providing iPads, Chromebooks, um, other kinds of tablets to students. Um, they have also been partnering with Verizon and Comcast to make sure that every student that needs it has internet and connectivity so they can access these resources. Um, and they have been mobilizing like so many people. I was talking to a paraprofessional who has been calling families because she is um, bilingual English and Spanish. She's been calling families to connect people to the internet. So they've been mobilizing everyone across the board to make sure that students at the very least are able to access these resources. Um, so there's a lot going on, but I think as far as like what's going to happen, um, I don't know really yet what's going to be changing from how things have been going. Um, I, I do know that, you know, statewide, the Department of Education has said that, you know, they think they're going to need to be planning for more long term, like looking forward, whether it's the fall, no one really knows. <laughs> no one knows. Um, so it's hard to say. Um, at this time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think we'll be hearing more. Yeah. I have a friend who's a parent and yeah, the news coming out this week about the school closure would just, it, it, it was kind of daunting uh, just because it's, it's such a fixture. And then you think into summer and like, Oh, we're, we're going to be in this through the summer. Mm -hmm. um, and to what degree we're, we're still in this crisis uh, in the summer, it remains to be seen. And um, hopefully you know, the things begin to open up uh, mm. over the course of the summer. But as you said, yeah, we just don't know. Um, I think we're also are, going to be starting to, I mean, we, we don't have the information yet for all those reasons that, you know, no one really knows yet. We're kind of on like a halting kind of one to two months at a time kind of schedule at the moment. Um, but when it comes to progress and what this means for all of these milestones, like MCAS, you know what I mean, that we have established in our public school system, they're suspended right now. And, you know, that means they're going to have to be, you know, suspending graduation requirements for certain students. And what does that mean? You know, will people take the test at a different point? How are people going to make up for this? Will people make up for this? Will there be summer schools that open up? How will they be virtual? Like, we don't know. But I think people, you know, our state government, our city government, teachers, parents, everyone is thinking about how how we're ever going to really truly recuperate from this in a holistic sense hmm. moving forward. So who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then um, our, our senior population, mm. um, the most vulnerable uh, uh, population uh, as far as the, the, uh, the coronavirus is concerned, uh, one of the most vulnerable segments. Um, what, what sort of uh, updates do you have regarding uh, keeping our seniors uh, protected? Sure. Um, so the city has been doing a lot in terms of the senior population, though I will say um, at the moment, again, because of uh, limited access to resources, um, they have been able to secure uh, some masks that they are distributing to, I think, uh, there's a little under 2,000 of Somerville's um, senior residents living in over about 20 buildings that are um, senior public and private housing. So some real housing authority as well as um, kind of group senior um, private housing, affordable, um, sorry, assisted living facilities and some um, mixed senior and family housing. So for example, um, I know I think there's a, a building at Clarendon Hill that is mixed family and senior housing. And in order to protect the seniors living there, they distributed masks to everyone in that building so that everyone could be um, kind of helping each other. Cause that's, that's the point about wearing masks. You know, they're help distributing these is going to help the seniors, but we all need to help them by wearing masks ourselves. Um, so they distributed two masks each to all of those people. So they distributed almost 4,000 masks. Um, and when I was talking to the mayor, you know, he 
he recognizes that, you know, kind of mandating um, that everyone wears masks, but not providing masks is kind of tough because not everyone has access to masks, which is part of why he wanted to get these to our uh, senior population. But he was also saying that, you know, Somerville purchased these um, from a, a, a Texas based company. I'm not recalling the name, um, but they, you know, they bought them and it took three weeks <laughs> to, to get anything. You know, it took a really long time for us to even get the masks. Hmm. Um, so he's like, you know, he said that they're always on the lookout for more masks. They hope to be able to provide them to more people, more vulnerable populations in the future, um, really to as many people as, as possible. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's taking time to secure that, uh, that kind of uh, resource. So, yeah. Um, I um, I was I'm pulling up this email that I uh, that came across my mm-hmm. virtual desk here uh, <laughs> over the week from uh, Linda Cornell, who's the president and CEO of the Visiting Nurses Association. Mm-hmm. Um, that actually had a, a pretty it was a pretty bright spot as far as um, assisted living communities, which you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, nationally and globally are, are, you know, you hear uh, kind of terrible situations coming out of these places. Um, but the VNA sent out this, this, these statistics that they have 200 residents and only one positive case. Um, and out of their 140 employees, they have two positive cases. Um, so they've really uh, taken on some aggressive measures at their, yeah. um, at their facilities. Um, and that's why these, these statistics are, 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 you know, as, as positive as they are. Um, yeah. so that's, that's, that's a ray of hope there. Um, it is a ray of hope. That's and, lovely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think you kind of, you kind of got to that, that one of the reasons that the city is taking um, these precautions is because, you know, when you have a number of vulnerable residents kind of in a close, um, in close quarters, that really presents a risk. Um, so they did the city, um, I think at the beginning of the week, they announced that they quarantined the Mount Pleasant senior apartments after there were eight cases confirmed there. Um, and while that, you know, that is frightening, um, it, it also is, is good that hopefully more residents will be saved from by um, them taking this measure. Um, and they're also, um, it was announced this week that they're requiring all, all um, you know, public, private, assisted living, you know, housing that has seniors and vulnerable disabled residents um, to submit safety plans um, that, you know, have, there's, this is like a list of minimum requirements for what it needs to have, you know, in terms of cleaning and sanitizing common areas, um, education of residents, um, testing of staff and residents, et cetera. Um, so all of these measures, hopefully together, you know, the PPE supplies, the uh, safety plans, um, in some cases, quarantining an entire building hopefully will mean that there are the lowest number of fatalities possible. Um, so even though it sounds scary, um, I think the city is taking a lot of good steps in that direction. Excellent. And then we, we, we're trying to keep these, uh, we, we try to end these segments with um, something positive uh, in all of this. Um, and so uh, you let me know about ways that businesses are, are trying to give back. Mm-hmm. Um, so, why don't we go into that? Oh man, I I have to say I know that you know the people the people out there on the front lines, the healthcare workers, the sanitation workers, you know they are just um, we have so much to thank them for for sure, um, and I, I think about them and. Also, in in this job, in this position where I am, I've been talking to a lot of businesses lately to kind of document how this is impacting and playing out in our community. And I have to say that, um, you know, you know, second only to those amazing, you know, frontline workers, these restaurants have been blowing my mind in terms of how how generous they are with while facing such loss Mm. um it doesn't make sense sometimes like you know i'll talk to a business owner and they'll they'll report like you know 25 percent drop in sales or more um and yet they're you know making meals every week (laughs) for for the homeless population they're donating meals they're um 
you know, the, I could go on and on, but I guess to name a few, um, Himalayan Kitchen and Union Square is giving away um, about 25 to 50 free lunches every Thursday. Um, you just walk by, you say you need a free lunch and you will get a free lunch from a preset menu. Um, but let's see what else, what else, what else? Uh, the Dark Horse Public House in Magoon Square. Uh, they tried their hand at takeout. It was not for them. Um, so they instead um, figured out how to get um, really good deal from their food wholesaler. And they have been providing affordable grocery service for a number of people mm -hmm. uh, for pickup. Though, if you are a vulnerable resident and you need it delivered, they will work with you one on one. Um, and what's amazing about them as well, you know, Summer will actually just uh, declared that all restaurants had the option of selling groceries, which is awesome. Hopefully it's going to help some people like hire employees back, help some people make some money um, while they're well, they would have otherwise been closed. Um, but Dark Horse is essentially doing this for zero profit. They're just trying to get the most affordable groceries out there that they can. And, you know, they're, you know, people pay for the groceries, um, but they're not paying for them to work. And currently, you know, they're out of work. They own a business. Their staff is out of work. Um, so it's just that kind of generosity. There's um, Bow Market, who has uh, created a safe supply outdoor grocery store with all of these different vendors. Um, who they have a donation station every week and they have collected over $2,000 for the Somerville Homeless Coalition. Um, they have also gotten several uh, local banks, the East Somerville, no, sorry, East Boston Savings Bank and Neveo, I think that's how you say it, I don't know, um, to do a, a match one week each um, to uh, maximize that money. Um, they're also going to be piloting a, another program where they're going to try to get... Um, you know, various Somerville restaurants to just one uh, one week um, each donate like 15 meals to the Somerville Homeless Coalition. They'll do the delivery for free. Um, God, I can go on and on. There's um, uh, Witch Witch in Assembly, uh, Assembly Square. Um, the Federal Realty Investment Trust actually is worth a mention. They've been funding 15 meals every weekday from different... Um, restaurants and assembly, including which, which, um, Pronto and one other, which I'm forgetting. Um, but what this has meant is that some rural homeless coalition gets meals and these people get to hire their workers to make the meals. So they're employing people, um, they're getting meals to the homeless. Um, I just, I, yeah, twirl in Arlington, technically it's in Arlington, but they're helping the Somerville homeless coalition. So we like them <laughs> and it's not so far. Um, yeah. They, you know, are struggling to pay the bills yet. They are, you know, every time someone orders, they put aside money to fund meals for the seniors in their community, to fund meals for the homeless in their community. Like all of these people are taking huge pay cuts. They've had to lay off their staff. They are, you know, small business owners who opened their own businesses, who've, you know, been, you know, put everything they have in these. And it's just, when I speak with these people, I ask them why, like, why are you doing this when you are losing so much? And it's not even a question. It's not even a question. They're like, well, this is our community. What else would we be doing? They help us, we help them. It's just like nonchalant. And I think it's, it's been giving me hope just as someone who, you know, I wake up, I read the news, I feel so hopeless all the time about what I can do to, to change and these stories, they certainly give me life. I hope they give other people life. Um, and I just really think it shows the um, generosity and resilience of this community that even when we are facing such struggle, we still turn to help others. Yeah, yeah. And it is uplifting, as you say. And it's it's heartening to see that um, communities are coming together at at the levels that they are, you know, at the city level, you know, at the the block level, the street level. Yes. Um, and it's, it's, it is hopeful. And um, you kind of wish you could see that a little more on the federal level, um, that exact same kind of yes. uh, generosity, altruism, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, being human. <laughs> That's my one little bit at an editorial there, but um, <laughs> disconnect between like what people are doing uh on the community level, the tight knit community level, um, and how they're no, I wanna, out there. Yeah, I want to add to that just because um, I spoke with uh, Matthew uh, Boys Watson, who is a one of the co-owners of Bow Market, and um, 
one thing he said was got, gets right to that point, which he said, you know, there's this sense that we're being left behind by the federal government. And really what we're doing in response to that is we're just pulling together. We're just, you know, we decided we're just going to rely on each other. Mm. And that's kind of what he said the, the, the kind of feeling is, you know, among his vendors and his businesses at Bow Market, um, which is, it's amazing to hear. It's a bummer <laughs> that we have to look out um, for ourselves like that. Um, but at the same time, wonderful that people are stepping up to the plate. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, Julia, thank you very much uh, for speaking with me. Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal. Um, stay safe out there and, and, and be well.